used to be out. Right. Like a week ahead of time. Now. 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 Good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to Navigating the Open Access Landscape panel discussion, which is being sponsored by the Drexel Libraries and the Drexel Graduate College. My name is Stacey Stanislaw, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Drexel Libraries. I will be your host and your moderator today. Uh, so a little bit about me. Before coming to Drexel about two years ago, I worked for an academic publishing company, and during my time there, I launched a new open access policy for the company's Library and Information Science Journals program. Uh, and I gave numerous open access presentations to lots of different uh, customers and different audiences, including librarians, students, uh, professors from all different types of, of disciplines. So I have a little bit of experience with open access. So I'm happy to be here and uh, hosting this event today. So this morning's event is part of our Scholar Snack student event series. It's a venue for Drexel Dragons to explore information and data tools and the different resources and to discuss their experiences with a library. This is our last Scholar Snack event of the fall quarter, but we'll be back again with plenty of fun and interesting sessions in January. So stay tuned. So for today, as the name of the session suggests, we'll be talking about all things open access, answering questions like, what exactly is open access? People actually pay to publish? And are all of these OA resources created equal? So I'm gonna start off by introducing our panelists here. I'm going to read from my notes. So first, I want to welcome Dr. Allison Kenner in the middle. Uh, she's the assistant professor in the Department of Politics and the Center for Science, Technology, and Society at Drexel University. Prior to coming to Drexel, Dr. Kenner was managing editor and program director for Cultural Anthropology, the Journal of the Society for Cultural Anthropology. As part of the editorial team, Dr. Kenner helped take the Cultural Anthropology Open Act take the journal to open access in 2014, and she led innovations in the society's publishing platform. Next, we have Dr. Gail Rosen, Associate Professor of Computer and Electrical Engineering at Drexel. Professor Rosen serves on the editorial board of the journal Microbiome, an open access journal without subscription or publishing charges, or any other registration barriers, which is published by BMC, part of Springer Nature. She has the Ecological and Evolutionary Signal Processing and Informatics Lab, she organizes the Center for Biological Discovery from Big Data and is the chair of the University Research Computing Facility at Drexel. And last but not least, we have Larry Milliken, Manager for Learning Partnerships and Liaison Librarian for Humanities and Social Sciences at Drexel. Larry has a background in medieval European history and has been a librarian at Drexel for the last 10 years. He leads the library's project encouraging the adoption of open educational resources and is particularly interested in scholarly communications and authors' rights. So, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna start off by reading a short definition of open access, and then I'm gonna read a quote, and we'll get into the, the discussion. So first, the definition. According to Spark, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic <coughs> Resources Coalition, open access is the free, immediate, online availability of research articles coupled with the rights to use these articles fully in the digital environment. So that's what open access is for anybody who is really new to this area. And now I'm gonna read a quote from Aaron McKiernan, a psych physiologist, neuroscientist, and an open access advocate. And Dr. McKiernan says, access to information is a human right, but it is often treated as a privilege. This has to change, and it will take all of us to make that happen. So, I'm gonna get into my questions now, I'm gonna take a seat. Uh, so as panelists, and as open access authors and editors and as researchers, What's your response to that quote? Um, you know, does it resonate with your own experiences with open access? What's the importance of this area and you know, making research available to people? So I don't know if you wanna just go down the line. Okay, yeah, I can um, go first. So basically, um, in my area, so I'm, in, I'm on the um, interface of engineering and biology. And so I actually saw kind of this blend from one area to another. Uh, when I first started out, I was mostly in engineering and electrical engineering, and we most people publish in IEEE. And IEEE is it started out as closed, not open access at all. Most universities pay, or College of Engineering pay, you know, um, a yearly fee, and then everybody at Drexel gets access to the articles in IEEE. And so that's how I had published, and then you know I came and I, I got my faculty position here, and I really started breaking into the biology field, 
and I realized no one's going to read my papers in biology because that field is very much you know, open access, you have to get your work out there to show people that you're doing work in that field. And so it was like, you know, all of a sudden, um, you know, just a new world for me. And so I had to navigate this new world. And um, so it was interesting because one of the first things I did is I wanted to just show people I was, I was publishing and actually working in a new field. So I went to, to a small journal that charged very little and it was unknown to the biological field and kind of unknown to engineering. But what I found is I published there and then a few years later when my work was a little bit more established, I published in an open access journal in biology. But because it was there and people got to use it, people went back and they wanted to know how I did my methods. So because that first journal article was open access, I found I got citations from both fields. And it was just a great experience, the fact that you can um, be open access. And so it was more of, you know, you're, you're going to get more publicity by being open access. And, but, you know, publishers want to make money. So most of the time they now charge the author to publish rather than charging the receivers. So the generator they charge rather than charging the receivers. So it's just another model and I think, you know, open access is a, is a right. Most research now is going at a light and fast pace because people publish their preprints online. And so the faster that you can publish, the faster that this field is going to go rather than, um, you know, waiting. You know, at IEEE, when I first started, like, it would take two to three years to get your publication out. And by the time you got your publication out, you were like two or three projects later. So, um, so it's really helped the pace of fields uh, develop and, you know, unless you're doing something that's, you know, intellectual property or something that you can't afford to publish right away, you know, I think you should really go open access to, to advance your field very quickly. Um, so I'll answer this question from the perspective of, uh, I'm a researcher that bridges a number of fields, uh, science and technology studies, which is an interdisciplinary social science field. We work a lot with folks in engineering, computer science, and public health. Um, I was trained by anthropologists, and I do most of my uh, publishing in, in that field and attend conferences, and that's where I have the majority of my experience is, is with publishing and open access is in uh, anthropology. And I think for me, the quote resonates for, for two reasons. Open access is really about um, making sure our research is accessible to the public and to the communities that we are conducting research with and on. So as an anthropologist and STS scholar, um, these are communities of, uh, for example, in my case, uh, communities here in Philadelphia or uh, patients who are suffering from asthma, for example, doctors. Um, so that's the first community audience that we want to make sure our, our research is accessible to. And the second would be um, researchers in other countries, scientists in other countries who don't have access to um, many of the publications that are housed in uh, North American uh, centric uh, institutions, libraries, publishing companies, or the Global North, for example. Um, and so one of the things that we've seen in the transition to uh, open access at CA is it's really shifted uh, who is accessing uh, CA publications where in the world and how our research is circulating beyond just the Global North and North America. So that's been a, that's been a huge change. And I'll say that I mean, the, the issue of open access for me really connects to the, the political economy of higher education and the ethical environment, to quote um, Samin Howe, who's the, one of the outgoing edi editors of Cultural Anthropology. Uh, there'll be an interview coming out in Serial Reviews in 2019 about CA open access. And she talks about um, ethical environments and how those are being created through open access in relation to the political economy of higher education. So this is really about 
um, you know, kind of broader issues in, in, uh, in institutional resources and who has access to knowledge production and uh, knowledge ac acquisition. Thank you. Um, it's great that I get to follow on the two of you because you've echoed a lot of the, the things that I've found, you know, interesting about the open access movement and, and my interest in, in um, the flow of information and the access, uh, access to information. Um, as a librarian, I want uh, the students and the faculty that I work with to find the materials that they need as quickly and easily as possible. Um, and I also want those who are creating uh, publications and um, releasing their research findings to have the, the widest reach possible. So open access is obviously very important to me for the social justice reasons, um, for the, uh, the scale of, of, of reach and the speed of reach. Um, those are all uh, great, um, great factors um, in the movement that, you know, that I've been very interested in. Um, also, my discipline, disciplinary background uh, in medieval history was actually a, a combination of art history, cultural studies, and history. Um, and the people who were working in those fields worked in very, or published in very small niche journals, um, you know, maybe uh, you know, 50, 100 subscribers worldwide, um, very small reach. Um, for very interesting work, and because it's interdisciplinary, it could have, could have, or could have had, a much broader appeal than than it did in the system that it, that people were working with when I was in graduate school. So my interest has, in that regard, has been in you know expanding, you know, expanding the reach and expanding the connections that people can make from one field to another. As Gail mentioned, you know, going from engineering into, into biology, um, just making connections that, uh, that maybe you don't realize or don't anticipate uh, is possible when the information is available freely. Um, and so that's something that uh, has been very important to me. Um, it's also been very important to me for, uh, for authors to make sure that, that they are able to do with their work what they want to do with their work. And making sure that this, the decisions uh, that govern those um, governs what happens are really made by them, um, and so sometimes that is signing uh, the copyright transfer agreement, and sometimes it's withholding rights and providing licenses and sharing. It depends on the unique circumstances, but I want people to be informed and to make the decision that works best for them. Great, thank you all. So in each of your responses, you were talking a little bit about you know, free to access and things like that. There are different types of open access publishing, though. There are still, sometimes there's costs, sometimes this content is completely free to anybody. There's no author charges, there's nothing. So Gail, I think bio, I'm going to mess up the title of the journal that you work on. I'm so sorry. Yeah, the, um, microbiome, that's completely open access? No, or there no, is, there's actually author charges. OK, so there are yeah. author charges for that yeah. one? OK. Um, some some journals that I've published in they'll uh, they'll offer a discount to authors like the university can mm -hmm. join um, the membership of BMC and so they'll give a significant discount okay. if your university belongs to that um, yeah most open access I think charge charge the authors uh, because they need to recover some right. costs yeah yeah have any of you worked on any or published in any or encountered any of the journals that are completely free there are no author charges because that is still an area of open access that people can or an area that is a model an open access model that people can look to if they don't have any kind of funding right so I can speak to cultural anthropology um, uh, we were so we had prior to going open access in 2014. And interestingly, the cultural anthropology, the, the back issues um, prior to 2014, those articles, those issues are still behind a paywall. Mm -hmm. um, but everything from 2014 on is open access. We are a gold open access journal. So to publish for free, um, you, 
need to be a member of the Society for Cultural Anthropology, which is a subsection within the, broad, the larger organization, the American Anthropological Association. If you are not a member, you have to pay $25 uh, to submit an article at this point in time. So the, the journal is really kind of supported by the AAA and the SCA membership and by those back issues that are still behind the paywall, which you know, our, the society does, has had to keep it behind the paywall because that is a you know, revenue source for the society that is needed in order to sustain the journal. Um, and so we are still very much figuring out the publishing model. Right. And, it's not, and it's not just about the production costs, which you know, I think since we've gone open access, we're actually paying less in production than we were with Wiley Blackwell. Um, but uh, we're still not able to generate enough revenue to sustain um, the, we would be able to s sustain the production cost, but I think what gets us is the cost of operating a website. And so the digital infrastructure surrounding maintaining a scholarly society and a publishing platform should not be underestimated. And we're kind of like, not housed within a larger institution. So that all plays into these discussions about gold and green and uh, diamond open access, for example. We do encourage self-archiving, both pre and post print uh, um, manuscripts. And we had, before we went to uh, open access uh, through the AAA, we had a, a archiving uh, project called Share CA. So, you know, we were, we were at, even though we were still behind a paywall, we were creating on the side this uh, preprint archive, which was housed at the University of Hawaii. So we did that up until 2014 as well. And you mentioned, I just want to go back, sorry, yeah. you mentioned Green Open Access. For anybody who may not know, can you speak about that a little bit, so any of you? Yeah, so Green Open Access, and, and I, there are so many experts in this room, <laughs> so if I've gotten my wires crossed, please. Because I, I think for me, the, the distinctions between green, gold, and diamond open access and self-archiving, for example, um, can really uh, be difficult to parse because it's about how you're paying for publishing, where the articles live, um, and who has access. So you have these three different variables. So it can be uh, difficult. So my understanding is that green open access is it's free to publish. There's no publishing fee. And the article, the pre and post print version is self archived. Those are the two main criteria of green, um, of, of the green model. Uh, I do want to just throw one thing uh, in here. I, I recently was trying to publish a special issue with an open access journal that is covering, um, that asks uh, all authors to pay uh, a fee to publish articles, and we were unable to submit to this particular journal, our special issue, because we had two postdocs um, two junior faculty member, uh, associate, and then a grad student who were part of the, the authors, and it was just not possible. The social scientists, we often don't have the funds to uh, pay for uh, the publishing fees when they're in the thousands of dollars, for example. Right. Yeah, and that is different. You mentioned it's $25 for yeah. non-members to publish in right. NCA, which is really, really cheap yeah. in the publishing world. Yeah. Uh, Gail, do you know how much it is to publish in Microbiome? I'll yeah, I mean, it can vary from, like I said, if the you have a discount, yeah. like a discount would be a thousand up right. to up to two thousand. Yeah. But I was gonna, I was gonna touch on your, um, if you want to publish for quote free, it's usually in a preprint, and it's usually through archive. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of archive.org or bio. Mm -hmm. um, in my field, it's bioarchive. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my students, um, or I had a student recently that he's just put up all his stuff on BioArchive, and now we're slowly trying to get it through journals. So, right. Yeah. Yes, there are different options out there. And that's something that is increasingly common, uh, even in the social sciences, which have been a little bit slower to take up the preprint archive. Uh, um, there's now a social archive, which is a preprint um, version of archive for... Uh, for sociology um, that has, uh, I think it's been in operation for about a year and a half, 
um, but is growing quickly. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a great trend. Um, a lot of times when people talk about green open access, it really is the self-archived, um, the author-approved manuscript, um, normally not the final typeset um, article that comes from you know, the eventual journal release. Um, and, um, and that's something that you know, could end up in an archive, it could end up in an institutional repository, or a disciplinary repository. So there are many different paths, and sometimes just on the faculty member's own um, university website. Um, so there's lots of different access um, routes for those preprint uh, articles. Um, and something about finding the funding, I had a great conversation uh, over the summer with uh, a woman who ran uh, research funding at the Robert Wood Johnson F uh, Foundation, who told me that you know, she hears from people, oh, my grant doesn't cover open access fees. And all of their, I think, current grants do. But even for an older grant that is finished, they want the, the work to be published. They want people to see the research that they, that they funded. So they, if you go back to them and ask for funding to pay an, open, or an author, author processing fee, uh, an APC, they'll give it to you. Because they want that work to be public. They want it to be known. Um, that's, that's why they paid for the work in the first place. So that's an option that a lot of people don't realize when they get a grant to fund their research is that you know, the funders really want to see it in print um, and are willing to um, often you know, go back and make an additional grant. They'd probably prefer if you plan ahead of time and ask for it when you get the grant, but, um, but they, they want to see that end product. They want, it, they want that information to be out. That was definitely something from the publishing side in my, in my past life that we heard a lot, especially from young researchers, students, and they'd say, you want $2,000? I don't have $2,000 to publish my article. Uh, that's really not what I mean. we're asking you. Publishers are asking for that money, but for the most part, they're not expecting it to come from individuals. It's coming from funding, from grants. Uh, are there other areas that you've received funding for open access publishing or that you know of that you can recommend to people who are are looking to, to pay some of these OA fees? I mean, yeah, mostly in, in my field, it, you write it into your grants right. and, and, and you try to do that. But um, like you've mentioned, if I don't have the funds at that time, I try to go up the chain of who wants to see this. So Drexel, you know, I go to my department head. I go to my uh, the College of Engineering. We, we got a Lewis and Bessie Stein Fellowship and it was not written into our fellowship, but we went back to them and we got more funds saying, you know, we, ha we had two publications that came out, will you fund open access? And they, they like you said, they usually will because they want to show the research output from what they funded. And I, I unfortunately have not received funding to publish open access yet. Uh, <laughs> definitely that's in the grants that I have applied for but I think there's an education component that needs to happen here so in the social sciences and humanities I just don't think that there is enough folks that have rallied around open access publishing yet where I feel like I can go up the chain and people will understand the the kind of need for that and the importance of publishing open access and making that possible mm -hmm. and supporting these initiatives. So I think that more kind of education and PR, if you will, needs to happen um, in our institutions and professional societies so that we can shift the culture in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are a few tricks that you could use mm -hmm. for IEEE, okay. which is basically they have a policy that if you, po if you post it online, if you self-archive, and then later, because it takes so long, it's like a year later, and then they typeset it, that you can keep up the original untypesetted right. so uh, version. Right, so there's version out there at least yeah. that people can yes. access. Yeah, so then you can kind of point to it on your website or mm -hmm. onto archive, right. and people can still get it. So there, there are little tricks that people play too. Right, so go to the, the journal websites, look around there, talk to your universities, your different departments, see if they have any funding for different stuff. Yeah. Great. So then, what are some of the benefits of open access? Why should people kind of go to the trouble to find this money? Uh, you know, what are the reasons to, to publish this way, not just to go to a, a traditional, you know, subscription-based 
publication. And we talked a little bit about uh, you know the access to information and stuff like that. But I guess from the the author perspective, what's the um, you know what's the encouragement? What's the the reason to do that? What uh, maybe talk about author rights is what I'm, I'm trying to get at. What are some of the rights that authors can retain with OA? What's the benefit? Okay. I mean, I I think I had mentioned early on that that basically you you can get your research out there a lot easier. But um, yeah, about author retention, I am not. As up on, as up on. I usually just waive my rights to IEEE any, anyway. But to okay. me, the benefit is for everybody to be able to read it. And, and like you were saying, some collaborations come about that you wouldn't have expected. Um, you know, somebody from CHOP said, "I read your paper on on such and such a subject," and you know, they're right down the road and they're interested in collaborating. So. I feel like you know somebody who would be hesitant to pay for your paper because they're outside of your field can now read it. Right. So. Yeah, I think one of the um, you know thinking about the the author rights dimension of this, um, just being able to do what you want to do with your with your work, uh, with your paper as um, probably the lead component, um, and there are lots of different ways of accomplishing that. Um, in some cases, you just want the paper out, and you know, signing the copyright transfer agreement, you know, is quick and easy. And if you're not thinking about future use of that work, you know, that's that's fine. Or if it's you know, it's the only way you get to publish in the journal that you absolutely feel like you must publish in, then that's fine. Um, most of the publishers will negotiate. Um, there are um, there are standard agreements. Uh, we have um, some links to those on our uh, uh, one of our library guides on author rights um, that you can use to say, um, you know, basically retain your copyright and provide either a you know a, a limited or exclusive license for the journal to publish their work um, to publish your work. So you're still retaining your copyright. You can still, you know legally send the email to your friends and use it in course reserves and you know print it out and hand it to your to your students and, and your and your colleagues um, and there's a great tool um, that is also linked on the author rights uh, library guide um, called Sherpa Romeo which um, is a listing of what various publishers and what various journals typically agree to um, so you know in advance when you want to publish in an Elsevier journal, what will Elsevier, Elsevier agree to? Um, same with Nature. And you'll, find, you'll often find that they're quite willing to agree to green open access to self-archiving. Um, depending on the title, they are likely to agree to green open access with an author uh, publishing charge. Um, and then there are some that, you know, no, they don't want to do anything fancy, but you know that going in. Um, so you, before you even submit your article, you know what you're likely to be able to, to um, you know, to negotiate for. Um, and it's just kind of a good, good rule of thumb before entering into any agreement, you know, negotiate. Contracts are negotiable. I, I really like that. Um, very smart to think about. And not something that we're taught as students are like mentored in even as postdocs and junior faculty members. And so I'm kind of like huge on how can we uh, increase education around uh, the economy of publishing, because it is an economy. And I think for me as an author, that's the one thing that um, makes OA really um, appealing, is that it, it's, again, to kind of ethically position myself and my scholarship within this economy of publishing and making sure that my research is accessible to students and postdocs and scholars that are not at institutions that have access to journals behind paywalls. And I mean, there's that that's a huge thing that I think we need to intervene in. I also think that open access publishing um, does a better job at um, acknowledging the way that scholarship is produced, that it's produced within community, it's produced 
through a lot of different kinds of relationships and that you know the the traditional forms and models of publishing are really kind of um, and this is something they're talking about in this this serial review uh, interview that the CA editorial team did um, that'll be coming out in 2019 talking about the, the, the this dyad author to reader relationship just kind of renders invisible all of this work that happens in scholarship and research and publishing and that OA is a model that is kind of acknowledging this broader ecosystem, this environment that scholarship is created in. And so I like that that is the ethic of OA publishing. So, yeah. Great, that was a perfect segue into my next question uh, about the ethics of OA publishing and everything we've talked about so far makes OA sound like this amazing, beautiful, lovely thing, but there is kind of that dark side of publishing, uh, of open access publishing uh, with the predatory open access journals. Can you talk a little bit about what that means? What is predatory OA uh, and how can you spot it? Have you ever received some of those emails? I, I assume that you mean these fake journals? Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I, I'm flooded every day with them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the first ways that you can spot them is it'll say, like, publish in the Journal of Engineering. And you're like, there's a whole journal for all of engineering? And um, yeah. and so you, that's the first way that you can spot one. Um, early on, I remember being able to spot them because they would be like, we'll turn your paper around in a day. Yeah. And, uh, and you're like, okay. Um, and... But I think they've become more clever now, and so really what I do now is that if I don't recognize the name, I usually delete it. If I'm halfway interested, I'll look at, well, who's, the, who's on the editorial board? Do I know these people? Um, have I ever heard of them? And, and are they really on the editorial board? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I've never had to go that deep. I usually look on that, like, I, I usually think I have, I've never heard of these people. Um, but I have, uh, there are even predatory conferences now. Oh, and really? I've, yeah. yeah, and I've even clicked on some of those, and there, there was one that I was pretty, getting pretty serious about thinking about, and I looked up, and yeah, it seemed like the people on it, there was a guy that had retired, or he, I think he had passed away. And then I was like, oh my, they're getting really clever now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so they'll pick, yeah, you're right. You have to verify that the people are really on it, um, and 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 see, and you you have to investigate just like any spam. So if you receive a spam saying, you know, we'll transfer money to your bank account, you have to think about what's, uh, how is this going to play out. And so it's the same. It's the same way as spam. And in fact, I receive it in the frequency of spam. Yeah, it's something that, um, you know, certainly in the library world, we, we hear an awful lot about. Um, and, um, you know, kind of a good rule of thumb, is, you know, especially for the graduate students who are, who are watching or, or in the room, if you're not sure, ask. Um, ask your librarian, ask your mentor, ask your, the professors that you work with um, what they think. Um, they have been getting clever. They've been using names that are subtle variations of well-known journal names. Um, it used to be, well, some of the advice that you still see is, you know, look for typos on the website or mistranslations or, uh, um, you know, really odd formatting um, in the emails. And those are all still clues, but they're they're getting better. They're They're cleaning up their act. They're making it look just like a real journal website, and and they've learned to you know run spell check. Um, but what is harder is you know um, harder for them to fake is you know an entry in the uh, journal citation reviews on the Web of Science. Um, those are very carefully vetted um, resources. Um, entries in the directory of open access journals. Uh, they've become over the years much more choosy about who they, what journals they list. Um, 
at here at Drexel, we have a subscription to a service uh, or a vendor called Cabell's. Um, there is a journal whitelist, um, and so it's not an exhaustive list of of reputable journals, but it's um, but it's journals that they have verified, and they remove journals from their whitelist on a routine basis if they start seeing things that um, look a little fishy. So there are lots of different resources that uh, scholars can use. It is primarily the early career um, scholars who are most at risk because you may not necessarily know the names on the editorial board um, and you may be under a lot of pressure to get a publication out quickly, um, which is totally understandable. Um, but it's the, uh, you know, the old adage that, you know, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. If they're promising quick turnaround, you know, a, you know, as you said, a day, um, you can't do peer review in a day. It doesn't happen that way. Um, so, you know, so look for things that are too good to be true. Uh, look for if they offer an author processing charge that's very low and you start to submit and you see that the actual charge is much higher, that's also not a good sign that it's not a legitimate resource. Um, there are lots of different tricks. Uh, another good thing to look at, uh, there's a website that's called uh, thinkchecksubmit.org and that gives you some good kind of steps to think about, not just for you know looking for predatory journals, but just trying to decide where you want to position your work in general. Um, and so those resources like that and just talking to your librarian and talking to your professor um, or mentor um, can help you kind of navigate those problems um, with as little risk as, as possible. Yeah, and you mentioned that young professors are most um, susceptible, but I've been getting recently, you know, come be an editor for yeah. a journal. Right. And that's, yeah, that's another can of worms even. I don't even know what they want. Out of it. Would they try to charge me for being an editor? I don't know. But They I, want your name on the, yeah. on the yeah, website, the and they want you to say, oh, yes, I'm an editor if somebody contacts you. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I think um, for me, this, this whole issue has been troubled by the fact that I want to support open access publishing. And so I think that what both Gail and Larry said very clearly is there's a labor involved in your commitment to open access publishing. You have to go out and kind of suss through the websites and figure out the editorial board and what does this actually look like. Um, and for me, especially, uh, I have a commitment to um, transnational scholarship and international publishing and building international research com communities. And so journals that are based in, for example, India or South America um, and are emerging, I want to support those scholarly communities. Um, but the, you know, so being able to read um, publishing practices and in institutions beyond the kind of North American context that I'm familiar with has taken a certain kind of work and a certain amount of work. Um, so the labor here, the, the ethics again, but also I think what, what Larry said very clearly as a, as a junior faculty member, and it's knowing how you should be moving through your career and so really kind of thinking about what networks you already exist in. There's lots of open access initiatives happening, for example, in my own fields of anthropology and STS. So kind of I have very purposefully kind of cast my lot and put my weight into those networks that I am familiar with for now. Um, and yeah, really thinking about publishing very strategically. And there's, we have such a limited amount of time and such a limited amount of energy to put into our work. So kind of knowing what networks you want to commit yourself to. And, and you know, for me, it's been about making the choice of staying within scholarly communities that are known to me. Um, which, you know, in some ways works against the goal of, of kind of building building pathways between different scholarly communities, especially across um, international borders. But um, yeah, these are all really kind of good things to be talking about. 
Do you have tips then for finding open access journals to publish in to you know, cite in your research? How do you find these different publications and how do you find these different scholarly communities that you can trust? And I guess how do you, how do you know the quality of them then? Are there, Larry, you mentioned a few resources. Uh, do they have any indication about the quality of these journals? Do you have to do kind of the standard research you would do when looking at any type of journal? Is that the same? I think it should, you know, it should be the same. You, you want the impact of your work to be as great as, as possible in whatever factor that concerns you most. You know, it's not just impact factor of the journal that you're in. Um, so it's a lot of the same work that you would do for any, any publication. But uh, there are resources that we have that um, do provide some indicators, you know, of quality of a journal. Um, you know, they they all have to be taken with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, and sometimes you know, especially if you're working in a niche field, um, you know, the best journal for your work might not be in a journal with the highest impact factor. It's you know, who is going to read that journal? Um, so those are all things that you kind of have to take into account, kind of what, regardless of where you want want to publish. But a lot of the resources that we do have will indicate if something is an open access journal, um, or have a way to limit to open access journals, mm -hmm. so you can see, um, you know, see what's there. And also, I guess the other thing is, you know, look and see where the the articles that you're reading. Um, are published and see if they are open access journals. Um, that helps too. Those are probably going to be the places you want to think about publishing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing is you know, is finding the communities. So, you know, I mean, at first I was an IEEE, and then I heard about people publishing um, in this journal called Eurosip, and their publishers were Hindawi which was the small publisher, um, and I know the biological community had never heard of Hindawi. And, mm -hmm. and basically, they had contacted me saying, we have this new journal, Advances in Bioinformatics. And so I know that their other publications were legit, and, and they said, well, we'll publish it open access. They only charged me, for me, this was super cheap, 400 bucks. Yeah. And I said, you know, I was a young, ambitious uh, um, scholar who wanted to just get my work out there and I thought okay let me do it and, and it's still up to this day because that's what you want at yeah. the very least yeah. and um, so I, I would say just try to figure out from previous communities and through new communities you know I, I go to the association for uh, the uh, the society for microbiology um, and so if you publish in these different societies uh, they'll, you know, they usually have open access options now. Like mm -hmm. you were saying, you can do it for a certain fee and, and go open access. I use all the same resources that Larry mentioned, basically. Perfect. I go to my, I go to my local library. <laughs> yeah, um, but also, too, I, there's been a couple of, um, you know, within our community, there's been a couple of journals that uh, have come out, Catalyst, which is a feminist STS journal, engaging STS, um, and then cultural anthropology. So, you know, and also in the social sciences and humanities, where our publishing is a little slower. Right. Um, and so, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm lucky if I get two or three articles out a year. So I'm, you know, don't need to find as many new journals right. as in other disciplines. Yeah. I think we have a question on that. Yeah, just wondering, how, how much has indexing and discoverability played into your, uh, played into uh, publishing in an open access journal as well? Yeah, that, that plays a, a really big part. I don't think my Hindawi advances in bioinformatics would have gotten cited if it weren't for Google indexing it. Yeah. So, a period. And, um, and I, I know that Clarivate and Web of Science plays a pivotal role in indexing articles. So you have to be indexed, in my mind, for it to be, yeah. for open access to be cited, especially if it's in a small, unknown journal like that. Yeah, yeah agreed. And cultural anthropology was um, unique in that it was, it was part of the AAA 
um, publishing suite and only you know went open access and so it already had it was already indexed and it already had a, a high profile and a high impact factor um, yeah so that in that case um, it was a very very different um, situation yeah, and there is an element of risk if you're publishing in any new journal. Um, there are, you know, there are journals that never make it to volume two, um, and that's, you know, closed access or open access. You know, running a journal is hard, um, and a lot of the high impact resources, you know, the web of sciences that are out there, um, they want to see a proven track record before they even include you in the index. A lot of them now have like an emerging scholarship track so that you are findable during the period that they're considering you, um, but you're not in the full index. I think Web of Science is something like five years. Um, so if you're publishing in a brand new journal, there is going to be, it's going to take a while before it is widely indexed. Um, it's still, if they're, you know, if they're or with a bigger organization, Google Scholar is likely to pick them up, um, if you know, especially if they have gone through and already have their ISSN um, set up and, and that sort of thing. Um, hopefully, you know, as time progresses, more attention will be will come to those those journals as they build reputations. Um, but that's that's the same whether it's an open access journal or a closed access journal. Probably what added to it as well is um, in medical research, there's what's called PubMed, mm -hmm. run by the National Institute of Health. And that also indexed my article. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and back then, I, this was published in 2008, people would just search on PubMed. They wouldn't even search on Google. So that, that's a great way to get your research out in the medical field. Great, thank you. So I want to pose a question and then Miguel's been working on this one is too. The movement of open access, I think, has has brought attention to really redefining publishing. Because we think of publishing and we talk about it as a publisher, an organization that's for profit, that's either not for profit or profit, but and the value that they add is partly for, for the academic community the the review and the, the peer review and the process of giving you added validity of your work by others, and in the whole tenure process, that becomes an issue often as to deciding where to go, and I'm curious if you want to give some thought to that. But I, how long ago, two decades at least now, it, the efforts to try to look at open access as not relying on another component of it, it's not, only, not relying on the publishing industry, but what some of you have alluded to is archiving and putting things mm -hmm. into repository. And all the issues that you're talking about, um, you know, the crazy people are approaching, it's the question of trust. Is it a trustworthy repository that will not only be legitimate, but it will offer you a time span that, that will be available? And the really difficult piece is the discovery, you know, and how do we get all these different areas? So there's work now, and partly because of funders requiring the open science concept that you have to make, not whatever your output is, both publications, the conference proceedings, however you're disseminating your, your new knowledge, as well as the evidence that supports it, which is the data. And we tend to look at, oh, the data is the new thing, but it's the whole package. And what's happening now, and, I, and I'm sort of trying to project what's going to look like in 20 years. And I, I think we're not quite at the tipping point, but it's definitely more than it was a few years ago when you have some of the big research one institutions and, and major scholarly um, houses of, are saying, you know, let's, let's make sure that our material is in trusted repositories. Let's work on ways to get it uh, discoverable so that it falls into the same process, integrated in the same search capacities in a trusted way but then also ensures that the world will have access. So if your main objective, is, as Allison said, is I want my stuff out there. Mm -hmm. how, how to turn to the infrastructure and, and participate and help build that, yeah. which makes those decisions to see, and it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So as Larry's saying, you can do what you want to do, but 
But this notion as an institution that we recognize your output is important to the university. Yeah. And it's the reputation of the university. And it's the reputation. So it is an output that's an institutional asset. So we're trying to work on building um, an infrastructure, make it easy for you. It may not be your last version, you, know, you may also want all those other ones, but to have some documentation of it uh, in the sources and whether or not this will really tip 20 years from now, that that will be the notion, who knows. That's that's the politics of the, of the finance behind it, but where to build it. And I'm wondering if any of you have thought about that, and, and different departments take a different stance on it in terms of evaluating you as a faculty member, your productivity, your tenure, uh, Ability, your impact when you're recruited to other institutions where you publish ones. Yeah. You I'm going to just jump right for that because I think this the issue of digital infrastructure and where things live is hugely important for open access publishing now and, you know, as a, as a long-term um, issue. And so one of the things that uh, where, where do we, if we go open access and we move away from uh, Wiley Blackwell, for example, um, where do the where do the back issues live? Where do the articles live? Where where does you know where does that go? And so finding institutional partners and in libraries for long term uh, contracts where we can kind of house the journal, and that's difficult when you have a journal that is moving from institution to institution every four years. So we have a new editor every four years. When the journal was at Duke, Duke housed the, the journal archives, um, and then it moved to Rice. And now it's split between three different institutions. So I think I've always thought that the, the matter of building digital platforms that can support the whole publishing, per, the whole publishing process from submission and peer review to actual production that needs to get figured out and it needs to acknowledge the fact that digital environments, digital platforms are living and constantly evolving and changing with standards and metadata and that, that so we need to collaborate with folks in the library sciences, computer science, um, and also uh, in the legal arenas too. So it really needs to be a dynamic um, community of participants in the, the problem of publishing in the future, I think. As far as the question of does it count for tenure, so I just um, put in my tenure file in August, and uh, so I think uh, I'll be interested to see going uh, forward. I did not kind of run into these issues in uh, here at Drexel personally, and I think that's because in part um, the field that I am is, is very book focused. So you know, I, I had my publications which were not in open access journals. I only had one publication going up for tenure in an open access journal, and I had the book in my other articles and so um, that hasn't been an issue for me yet but I, uh, one of the things that I really think we have to think about um, very seriously and institutionalize is our commitment to open access publishing as we move through um, our kind of promotion and evaluation processes because that, that's something that you hear um, all over the place as an issue for folks in the social sciences and humanities I don't know what it, what it's like in your field but um, yeah, basically, if you're in engineering, it's like IEEE, and they don't value open access as much, I think. So like as long as you publish in what the society does. But um, in the bio and then the medical field, because NIH has a clear mission that they want to propagate re health research, and they want to make it open access, you have to publish open access. Hmm. So yeah. Um, but yeah, for in terms of like that it's an institutional asset, I, I think that you have a dichotomy here because the, the author, you know, has rights to their publication. They might move um, institutions later, but it was done with the resources of that institution. So, you know, I think both should retain some rights and some and, and can retain um, uh, 
you know, access to that publication and to that work that was done there. But both have, have rights to it. And I, I wanted to note on one thing, because I thought this was so timely, that I received an email from Elsevier yesterday um, saying, oh, we found one of your publications on ResearchGate. And they said that um, uh, they've tried to work with ResearchGate. ResearchGate is not um, cooperating and taking down publications. And that they were going to issue takedown notices, TDNs, for articles which it should not be hosting. So they thought that they would notify me in case I'm the one that posted, which I didn't post that publication. I looked it up, I was like, who posted it? You can't really tell who posted it. Hmm. But I thought this was funny that you know Elsevier, and then they listed IEEE on here, everyone, um, that they're part of a coalition for responsible sharing, and that they're going after ResearchGate and other... Um, uh, responsible sharers. Yeah, yeah <laughs> other sharers. Um, to, to take down uh, publication. So it's it's quite, you know, we're in, we live in interesting times that, you know, these publishers want to make money, but they, they, they don't know how to, to resolve with the information wants to be free in these sharing networks where it's easy just to share a paper on ResearchGate. So. Yeah, or the I can has PDF hashtag on Twitter, you know, yeah. which is, you know, I'm looking for this article, I can ask PDF and someone will send you the PDF. Yeah. Um, but with an open access publication, you don't have to worry about that. Yep. Absolutely. Well, is, I was just going to say, this is again where trusted repositories have a very strong yeah. offset there. Because what you don't know, as you said, you don't know who put that article on there, or what, what they put on there. Yeah. They've edited and everything else. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have a institutional commitment to having, whether it's your association, NLM, your own library, whatever, or your own, your own university, it's, it's a commitment to making sure that that is authentic scholarship and make it available. That's an interesting question that comes up with some of these, um, you know, like unlocked version services that will find you a free online version of an article, but is it the complete, finished, reviewed, trusted version, or is it 16 drafts back that, you know, one of the authors put online? You know, I think we spend a lot of time talking with students about, you know, peer review and other mechanisms of quality control, but, you know, with all of the you know, more and more of the self-archiving options, there becomes the question of which is the authorized, authentic, trusted version of an article. Mm -hmm. I really think that, I mean, you talk about, we we're talking about trust, which is huge, and labor, and um, authenticity, and sharing, and, and so for me, all of this really just kind of, I keep coming back to the issue is the, the kind of ethics of publishing and creating these ethical environments towards publishing, um, towards publishing infrastructure. Absolutely. Well, I'm conscious of the time. It's 11 o'clock, and I think some of our panelists have to get off to other uh, commitments. So I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, there's lots of information on our various library guides. If you go to the Drexel website, or the Drexel Library's website, you can find them there. Um, you can find information about our panelists on the various department websites if you have questions uh, following this presentation. So thank you all very much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank Great. you so much. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.